This is Coach Schumann here for the Success for Life podcast. I'm on with Coach Ray Rassiope, one of the QB coach extraordinaires out there, especially on the East Coast. Um, one guy who's really uh, improved his brand from a coaching standpoint and, and where kids are lining up, not just kids, but pro quarterbacks as well, are lining up uh, to work with him. He's bec fastly becoming known as one of the QB whisperers out there around the country. Tony, welcome on, to being on the Success for Life podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Dave. I really appreciate this. I got to watch you live work with one of my guys a little bit, at least. And, um, you know, I, I come very impressed away with, uh, you know, your charisma and your enthusiasm and your excitement for the game. And, and obviously, kids respond to that. T tell everybody a little bit about your – I mean, I know your background, but a little bit about your background uh, so they can understand a little bit more about you, where you come from coaching-wise and, and all that. Uh, well, I appreciate you having me, number one. Uh, number two, um, you know, from a background standpoint, so I grew up in uh, Ocean Township, New Jersey, down the shore. I uh, went to high school at Ocean Township High School, freshman, sophomore year, started, uh, started as a sophomore, was all state as a quarterback. Um, transferred to Red Bank Regional, played my junior, senior at Red Bank, as well as uh, I was a basketball guy and a baseball guy, too, so I was a three-sport guy at 11 varsity athletes in high school, or varsity letters. Um, went to Tennessee Tech. I actually committed to the University of Maryland as a junior. Uh, to play quarterback, and their staff got fired like 10 days before the signing date. So I was kind of stuck, um, you know, eight, nine, 10 days from signing day. So I ended up committing to Tennessee Tech because one of the coaches from the Maryland staff ended up going there. So, um, you know, at that point, you know, I, I went down there. I redshirted a year, uh, played quarterback my redshirt freshman year, was ranked 20th in the country in passing, and uh, I got moved to linebacker. So, uh, you know, things didn't really line up for me from the quarterback standpoint <laughs> my life our, our uh, athletic director's son was a true freshman at the time so um you know I, I learned that you know it doesn't matter sometimes how hard you work uh, it was a really good life lesson for me so I came home and, and uh weighed a lot of options I, you know whether it was going to a division one school to transfer to or um at that time Rowan University was was um you know they playing in the NCAA finals uh, a bunch of times um you know turned out some really good players over the years so I, I decided to go there it was the best decision I ever made in my life and um you know, I played as a sophomore. I started as a junior. I led um, all of college football in, in touchdown passes um, and yards, uh, all levels as a junior and senior year. I, you know, again, finished um, you know, in the top 10 in that. So, you know, when I graduated, I was the fourth rated passer for NCAA history. Um, you know, it was just an awesome experience. Opened a lot of doors for me. So I, I played overseas for a year. I came back and played arena football for a year. Lang City Car Charts had an indoor team for one season, which was awesome for me being a Jersey kid. And obviously going to do uh, college in South Jersey. You know, a lot of my friends came and, and uh, family. Um, and then I actually signed with the Jets in 04 as a free agent. Um, you know, they were high on me in the draft. Uh, they actually called me in the fifth round, told me they were going to take me in the sixth round if things kind of lined up. I would have been the first Division three quarterback ever drafted. Uh, they ended up taking Brooks Bollinger um, in the sixth round, which, you know, stunk for me. But, um, you know, it, it just kind of made me stay patient, work hard, and, and uh, things still kind of lined up. So I was there in 04 as a free agent, got cut. And then I went down to uh, the Dolphins in 05 as a free agent and got cut. So at that point in my life, I just, you know, wanted to still play as long as I possibly could. Obviously, things didn't work out for me, so I, I jumped into coaching. So I, um, at that time, I, I was the office coordinator at Kane University for one year. I started teaching phys ed at Union High School. I uh, did that for a year and a half. Um, got a job at Temple as a GA under Al Golden in 2006. I was the offensive GA, George DeLeon was the OC. Uh, great learning experience for me, but I also learned that at that time in my life, college football was kind of um, not in the cards for me. I, you know, just from an hour standpoint, from a time standpoint, um, you know, just Temple situation wise, you know, we were kind of like, I was the assistant quarterback coach, I was the GA, I was the secretary, I was, you know, the jack of all trades. So, um, you know, learned a ton, learned a lot of ball, which is great, but, um, just wanted to decide that I wanted to be a phys ed teacher and, and, and a high school coach. So um, and there's people in my family that do that. And I just, I saw the impact they made on people's lives. One, uh, two, I just saw their lifestyle. You know, they always seemed happy and content and, um, you know, made a difference, you know, like we, me and you both do. So, uh, you know, I, I coached at Long Branch for two years down the shore. Danny George, the head coach there, who's one of the biggest mentors in my life, um, is, you know, I consider him an uncle. He's been with me since I was you know, a little kid. I've known him, family, friends. Um, and then I came up to Franklin. So I taught phys ed at Franklin now for 11 years. I coached at Franklin for nine years. And I've been to Hunt School now in Princeton for two years. So that's kind of my 
my background as far as playing and coaching, um, you know, from the, the private world, it's kind of funny. I was, I always tell people, like, you know, I, I've been a head coach in basketball. I've been a head coach in baseball. I've been a head coach in football. Um, I really never got into the private stuff just because I was always coaching. So, um, you know, really, I interned with the Jacksonville Jaguars two summers in a row uh, in the summer in training camp with the offensive staff, with the quarterbacks, where I met Buddy Tevens at the time, who, who's Dartmouth's head coach and, and runs the Manning camp. So that's where we kind of connected. Um, saw me coach, saw me do my thing, and invited me to be a counselor at the camp. So i worked the Manning camp now six years. I'm one of the top guys. I, you know, all the uh, top college quarterbacks they invite in. I, you know, I'm one of the four coaches they invite on the field with Eli and Peyton to actually train those guys for four days, either at lunchtime or later on in the day between sessions with the high school kids. So it's been a great experience for me and obviously getting to work with the top end guys. And, um, you know, from a confidence standpoint, like, yeah, you fix guys that are playing at Notre Dame, UCLA and USC and, you know, top five picks, it gives, just gives you more confidence to work with anybody. So um, that's how I kind of got into the private stuff was just, I started training those guys and then, you know, college guys started wanting to get work in and then pro guys started wanting to get to work in. So that's where I started working at test just do the combine stuff. And then, you know, I remember starting, I had like five or six high school kids. That's the only time I had. I would do a group of six high school kids and that was it. And I would lock it into six and I would kind of do those guys for two, three months at a time. And then it just got to the point where it got bigger, bigger and bigger. And now I'm at the point where I got, you know, over 70 high school kids signed up for multiple sessions with me right now uh, on top of, you know, six combine guys. And then now obviously the pro guys coming back off the NFL seasons. That's really cool. That's an amazing, amazing practice you built up there. First of all, Atlantic City, I don't know if you know, Arena Football's coming back. I um, saw that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's coming back. My, uh, my roommate from college, Shane Stafford, is uh, going to be the office coordinator there. Yep. So pretty, pr- pretty cool. He actually just reached out to me a little while oh, – co- actually, a couple days ago uh, to talk to me about everything down there because he's not familiar. Um, right. Yeah. From, you know, they, uh, boardwalk Hall, obviously, right? Yeah, Boardwalk Hall. Yeah, yeah it was great. It was an awesome home field. It was, uh, you know, we shared a locker room with the uh, Boardwalk Bullies, the hockey team. Yeah. Um, and it was, you know, again, it was you couldn't beat it. I mean, for me, being a Jersey high school kid, right, and a kid that played college in South Jersey, it was, like I tell people all the time, the toughest games I played were home because all my idiot friends would come and, you know, bust <laughs> my chops. And, you know, going on the road was, like, easier for me, you know. So, yeah, it, was, it was awesome. I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. That, that that's that's interesting. It's funny because I live now in Lincroft, which is right by where, near where you grew up. Sure. Amazing area. So, uh, um, and football wise, it's it's a great. Even though I coach in you know up, up in North Jersey, this area is a great area for football. Right. For football, absolutely great area. Uh, t- tell me a little bit about. So, you got into the, you're in multiple different levels. So you've been in the high school level, you've been the college level, work with guys at the pro level. Uh, what have you found is is kind of the difference in coaching athletes at each of those different levels? Um, you know, I, I think, you know, the thing that's common on all three is that you're developing, right? You're, you're making guys better. Um, you know, a lot of times high school kids, you know, like, you know, the fun thing for me is like I'll, I'll do, I'll do like 42 to 50 kids on a, on a Sunday right now. So, I mean, Sunday is just insane for me, you know, and, and um, I do groups of six, no more than six kids or everybody gets coached up. You know, it doesn't matter how many more kids I add. I just got to add more sessions. Um, I believe in small groups. Um, you know, but the fun thing for me is that, you know, the same day I have a seventh grader and I'm teaching them literally how to get in a great balanced space. You know, at the end of that day, I have a Davis Webb coming in. You know, we're talking about, you know, Greg Williams secondary coverage and, uh, you know, under fronts and, uh, you know, zone blitzes and all that kind of stuff. So on the same day, you're covering so many different things. Um, you know, the nice thing about the, the nice thing about the high school kids are sometimes they're so raw that you have this big ball of clay that you can kind of mold and help and uh, and uh, you know the thing for me is like I coach high school and I've coached high school I've coached college and obviously I've interned in the NFL three times two times with the Jaguars and two summers ago I was actually with the Cardinals which was an awesome experience because I was I was on the offensive staff in in the morning and throughout practices and then after dinner I flipped over and did the personnel side at night so I learned the whole NFL business. I was there for 17 days, you know, so that was awesome for me, even from a, you know, from a training standpoint, obviously, as you know, as an agent, the stuff you go through uh, kind of both sides, it was just, you know, again, it was, it was eye opening. It was, um, my mind was blown in a lot of areas. Uh, <laughs> you know, the biggest thing I see, honestly, um, you know, I, I feel bad for the college kids of all the, of all the levels, just because, and, and I don't blame the college coaches. It's just the way the time is set up. Um, you know, they, they really don't get a, t- a lot of time on the field in season, right, with Indy, you know, so fundamental 
fundamentals were kind of lacking at that time. Um, you know, and I've been there. I've done it, you know, so I know how they feel. Um, number one, number two, in the off season, they can't work with them, you know? So like those guys, there's a dire need for the college kids, especially the division one guys, you know, they want to come home and, and obviously work on their game. And a lot of times, you know, if your fundamentals are struggling, you're struggling as a player. And then obviously if you're struggling as a player, you're going to, your confidence dips. So a lot of times when guys come home in the winter to work with me, most of the time it's, it's fixing them fundamentally. And, and the second thing is fixing them mentally, you know, like instilling the confidence back into them that they are really good players and that, you know, it was just, hey, it might have been your front shoulder. It might have been, you know, the way you were dropping. It might have been the way your front leg was closing you off, um, you know, to the middle, to the left side of the field, which made you swing. That's why you're late. That's why you threw some interceptions. So um, it's, it's interesting seeing the different levels. You know, obviously, you know, NFL guys come in and they don't want to work on, you know, A through Z a lot of times. You know, you lot, a lot of times those guys will come in and be like, uh, Tony, listen, my back foot, it really gets me in trouble. Like, I want to focus on A, B, C. And that's, you know, that's what we'll do. You know, the nice thing about those guys, as you know, is they have so much access to film. You right. know, a lot of those guys, like, you know, like Davis will go watch Aaron Rodgers for a week. You know, come in with notes on him of the things he likes and maybe he wants to try and, and incorporate in his game. So that's what we'll do. And then at the end of the day, it's like, okay, do you like that? All right, let's keep it. Let's, let's put it in your game. Or it's like, oh, you know what? I can't do that. He's just really good. <laughs> you know, so, you know, that's, that's kind of how we do things. So. And to answer your question, the neat thing about the experience is, is there's so many different kind of kids and so many different levels, and everybody needs something different. It keeps you engaged and challenged at all times. It was one of the interesting things I saw, um, uh, just building off, you know, what you teach. Um, so, obviously, as a head coach, I, I actually coach quarterbacks for, from all the teams I've ever been a head coach for. Awesome. And I, and I thought what's really interesting is um, um, where you talk about the jump stop at the top of their drop. Right, it's something different than I've seen other quarterback coaches teach. Well, um, sure. and it's interesting. It's so it's order, I guess, to form a, a quick gather so they can get rid of the ball quickly, um, right. which is different than where a lot of people teach, like plant that that third step, plant yep. that fifth step. Push you out of the pocket, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. What What's the theory behind that, and what, what do you think is the impact that it has on on the quarterback's uh, delivery? You know, the one thing I've seen in, in, in a nice thing about working with guys at all levels, so you start seeing so many kids and you see the common flaws, no matter what level, right? Right. So the common, flaw, the common flaws I see in people's games most of the time are throwing the ball to the left of the field from a righty, right? Right. Also on the hitch. So on the hitch and in, in the pocket, most of the time guys hit that back foot too far outside their back hit, right? They push off that back foot, and either get too much weight on that front leg going forward. So A, I'm off balance. And B, I lose power, right? right? Number one, number two. Also, guys that push off that back foot at the top of the drop push up, and they get too wide of a base, right? And they're constantly sailing the ball, and it's kind of like almost into an overstride kind of thing, you know? Where you know, again, I lose my hips a little bit, my elbow's going to drop, my front shoulder's going to pop up, and I and I sail those second level throws. You know, so I realized I, I really, really, I came up with that through you know Drew Brees and watching Tom Brady. You know, Tom Brady um, jump stops almost every single time he throws the football. You know, he's not much. Um, now, a huge rhythm guy, never really hitches up in the pocket unless he climbs the pocket. So I, I separate movements in three ways. I separate, obviously, jump stops, which are our resets, right, where I'm bounced and I'm throwing the ball, the one, two, three, four, whatever in your progression. As, uh, I have climbs where I'm moving up in the pocket because I have to, right? I'm getting edge pressure. And then, obviously, slides off the midline. So that's how I kind of teach all three things in different segments. And then, I'll obviously, marry it together, like, you know, in game-like drills. You know, so I came up the jump stop through watching Brady, you know, like really so Brady actually Brady goes like cross, you know, a crossover foot jump stop. So he doesn't really hit his back foot a lot of times because again, like I said, most people make bad throws off their hitch game because their back foot screws them up. That's so interesting. That's really, really interesting. And I'm definitely going to apply that now with my guys. It's really good. I saw that. I thought it was <laughs> and I, I was watching how, uh, how good the ball was coming out from these guys when they were doing it and, and, and they were, and they were having much, power and still maintaining the base they need to have and everything so I, uh, I thought that was really right. interesting um uh, so NFL wise you said your 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 mind was blown a little bit I want to I want to build on that uh, before I go into the next thing so wh what was it about the the NFL experience that you you found that was so interesting in, in turning with them um you know I, I obviously knew the playing you know the playing side did it for two years right I mean obviously wanted to, to do it more than I, than I did right but um you know, so I interned with the Jaguars, right? So I was just football when I was down there two summers in a row. So that was an eye-opening for me. You know, like I, I was impressed with a lot of the coaches, learned some new things, learned some new, um, 
you know, some schemes, some X and O's that I've really incorporated in my NFL draft prep stuff with my guys in the classroom. Uh, you know, but the Cardinals was great because I got to literally obviously see the coaching side, right? But I also got to see the personnel side and kind of how ownership kind of mended in. So, I'll, you know, as a player, sometimes you're so naive to things and what goes on behind the scenes where I was able to see kind of all three facets of, a, of an NFL team. You know, so I saw the ownership side, saw how they, um, you know, their relationship was kind of with personnel and the personnel side with the coaching staff and kind of how all three kind of groups kind of have to mend together and make a decision on a, on a backup quarterback or a, a fourth receiver or, a, you know, a, a tight end or, you know, those kind of things. So, you know, it, it was neat seeing all those things because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's something maybe I wanted to get into. Um, I've had some opportunities in the NFL to be kind of a quality control guy or kind of get in as, as an entry level guy over the last two or three years, just because I've met so many people doing this and people see a coach and obviously, I mean, you know, you go through it when people see you do your thing live you know, they're impressed with you. So it's, it's the ultimate compliment, you know, and, and, you know, the fun thing for me being a quarterback the last couple of years is, is uh, a lot of times I'll have receivers and tight ends come in as well to test and uh, I'll end up throwing at pro days. You know, so I've thrown at Rutgers, I've thrown at Monmouth, I've thrown, you know, kind of all over the place. So, right. you know, people see you interacting with kids and motivating and, and um, you know, you, you, it's, you're in your element, you know, it's the best way to describe it. Absolutely. What what have you found uh, quarterbacks between like you worked with a lot you work with a lot all the time, um, ongoing. What have you found is the difference between quarterbacks that get to you know towards those elite levels uh, from a mindset standpoint, and then and this is really you know to help high school kids that really want to know because you see it all the times. Um, but this could go for anybody, but, you know, high school kids that want to become college players, college players that want to become NFL players. Like what, what's the mindset, uh, things that, that can really get them to a different level. Um, and let's just take a talent aside because obviously they're physical tools that, sure. Sure. that, that are needed. But, uh, from a mindset standpoint, what are the things that you think are required for a quarterback? Um, I mean, the, the ultimate, um, the ultimate competitor, right? So at the end of the day, quarterbacks are the most competitive guy in the room, whatever room they walk in, there's, there's, there's a certain look to a quarterback when he walks in the room, um, there's an attention on him. Um, I, I think there's, you know, I, you know, between that, I, I think, you know, the second thing is the attention to detail, especially in the classroom, uh, through film study, knowing themselves as they get older, you know, like uh, a lot of times guys that, you know, when they get to their 23, 24, 25 years old, they kind of know themselves, right? They know, right. like I knew, you know, like I knew I was a baseball guy, right? So I knew when I made bad throws, I was pitching the football, you know, like I was pushing off the rubber, I was pushing too much and I was an overstrider when I made a bad throw. So like you, you kind of know yourself as you go through this, number one. Number two, I think as they get older, honestly, the less coaching you get from an individual standpoint. So you know, a lot of times in college, they're going to coach you. They're going to coach the starter. You know, so when you're the third string guy or the, you're the uh, red shirt guy, a lot of times you have to kind of coach yourself from a fundamental standpoint, you know. And obviously in the NFL, a lot of those guys, you're on your own, you know. So you're watching your film. You're, why am I throwing the ball low? Why am I throwing the ball low and behind? Uh, why am I late? You know, like all those things, that, that's on you to break down that film and study that film and know yourself and know what drills really to fix those things. Um, you know, so a lot of times when those guys come in, the, you know, the juniors, the seniors in college, obviously the NFL guys, they know themselves pretty well. You know, it's, it's okay, how do I fix this issue that I have, right? And then when I'm at practice or, I'm, or I'm, you know, it's game five and it's that week, I'm kind of struggling right now throwing the ball. What can I do to fix those things? So that, that's the biggest thing I see is, is they're, A, they're the ultimate competitors, and B, they know how to fix themselves as they get older. That self, that the self assessment, which obviously is a is a difficult thing because you got to be able to, to look at yourself and and be critical of yourself and not just pat yourself on the back, right? Um, and, and not blame blame you know what other people see as a flaw sure. uh, on somebody else. That's so I think that's a, that's a really interesting thing. That self assessment. I, I think what's really interesting is the competitiveness because like I guess if you ask nine out of ten. 10 guys, they would say, you know, their leadership ability. But when you watch Tom Brady, obviously leadership is really wrapped into competitiveness. Right. I, am, I, am I right to assume? It's, it's, I think it's a combination of competitiveness and work ethic, right? right. So if you're a, one of the hardest working guys there and your most competitive guy there, people are going to follow you. That's really cool. That's really, really exciting. I, 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 I actually wrote that down because it's something that, that – I think a lot of people can learn from that ability to be competitive. And then that, that self-assessment ability, that key, those are two things that, um, 
uh, may not always go hand in hand. In mo- I, I would say in 99% of individuals in the, in the world, the ability to be ultra competitive and then be a self assessor is, sure. is, is a difficult thing. So that's, that's really what can make a guy like a, a, a Tom Brady or an Aaron Rodgers or, right. uh, you know, or, you know, even an all state quarterback uh, versus a guy who's, um, you know, a good quarterback. Well, I think you're seeing it too. I think you're seeing it at the pro game. I mean, there, there's a reason why those guys are playing now to their late thirties and early forties is because they're, they're honest with themselves. They, they reassess themselves every summer. You know, and I think that if you watch Drew Brees, you know, season two compared to this year, if you watch Tom Brady in his third season compared to this year, they've changed fundamentally for the better. You know, they've constantly reassessed their fundamentals. They constantly reassess their diet, their nutrition, and their, their off-season programs for the better. You know, and I saw it even with, um, you know, I'm obviously very close with Eli and Peyton. You know, over the last couple summers, I mean, he, this is the best Eli Manning's ever looked last summer, you know, because he, he changed what he did. He changed his diet. He changed his work. Um, you know, more pliability stuff that Tom does, you know, more flexibility stuff in his training. Um, you know, fundamentally, he's, he's changed some things that he's done in the past, say. You know, a lot of times, you know, those, you know, in the 90s, you were kind of taught to load on your back leg, right? You rip your front shoulder when you step and you transfer your weight and, those guys aren't doing that anymore and stuff obviously that I teach because I've, I've gotten that stuff from some of the best guys that have ever done it, you know? So, you know, I teach certain things and all the things I got, I got from really those guys and being around those guys and talking fundamentals. And, you know, it's funny. I, I, um, I met Kurt Warner a couple of years ago and uh, we were talking fundamentals. We're talking footwork. And um, he's like, what do you teach with this? What do you teach with that? He's kind of picking my brain a little bit. So he goes, what do you teach to the left? And I was like, I teach, you know, buckets, bucket step, right? Like we all, you know, it's the way I was taught, right? Usually you teach what you were taught because it's what you know best. And um, he goes, well, what's your philosophy of quarterback training? What's your philosophy of playing quarterback? And I was like, well, I, I want balanced rotational throwers. That's my philosophy. He goes, well, Tony, what's balanced and rotational about buck steps to the left? And he shows me what I was teaching. I, I was like, you know what? You are 100% right. <laughs> like, I feel like the biggest hypocrite in the world. So he goes, why don't you have him dovetail? Why don't you have him turn? It goes in your philosophy. It's about being balanced and straight to every throw, right? So you want to you want to take the middle of the field and you want to turn it with your crossover foot. So that last crossover sets every angle you have and sets your balance to every single throw. And if you do that when your back foot hits, it's a straight throw to every guy from sideline to sideline. And I did it three or four times, and I was like, you know what? It's one of those like duh moments, right? Like why didn't I think of that earlier? You know, like, why did I think of that idea? And, and uh, you know, for him, he goes, it changed, it changed my game. I, I was a Hall of Fame quarterback because I started doing this in my game with the Rams, and I didn't miss throws anymore, especially to the left. That's interesting. That's really interesting. What, what, do, you, what do you think also on, I guess, maybe like the 90s, the, there were quite a few lefty quarterbacks. But basically, you know, like as an agent, when a, a guy comes to me and he's a lefty quarterback, it's basically like, no, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So, no, what, many. yeah, what, what do you think has changed? Is the fact that people don't want to adjust their playbook going to the left, or I, I, I think that I think that's one hundred percent right. I think they, um, you know, a lot of times they're doing as, as you know, they're doing a lot of the mental tests now with guys. You know, I know the Rams or not the Rams, the uh, Saints do one where it's kind of um, it's kind of like how you learn, you know. So it's like that six personality trait test, right? And and um, a lot of times. Uh, they have Drew Brees scores in those categories. So they wanted a guy to kind of, you know, if, if everybody's equal, right, from a skill standpoint and a trait standpoint, they wanted a guy to most learn like Drew so they didn't have to reteach things, which I thought was interesting. I, I, you know, I learned that one the other night. So, um, you know, it, stuff like that, you know, again, I, I think as, as much as they can keep common, and again, it's all about what? It's all about the starter, right? So if you're, if you're the two, three, or a practice squad guy, they want you as close to the starter as possible as they can, they can kind of marry all those things together. That, yeah, I guess that's what it is. That more of the starters are are, are righties, and I then it's just trickling down that, down all the way. Right. Um, you know, obviously college and and not high school, but college. Right. You have less lefties at that level. It's really interesting. I was reading a whole article about it and and how like at one point there was there were quite a few, but now they're just basically right. Right. they're basically well, I mean, probably makes more sense in in college, right? Because the hash marks, you know. So right. You know, a lot, you know, a lot of times now with the college game, you know, a lot of times their concepts are more field boundary as opposed to, like, strength, you know, strong weak or right left, you know. So, more it's more boundary, uh, boundary safety reads, you know. That's the, the key for where you're going with the football. So, 
you know, a lot of things, you know, a lot, a lot of fun for me right now is, is the fact that, um, you know, like when you have these guys come in for the draft, you, you know, I'm also learning five, six, seven college offenses every year that they've run, you know? So I'm, I'm kind of, again, adding that into my repertoire and, and from an X no standpoint, it's, it's interesting hearing the different ways guys were taught to read coverages or taught to read concepts and a lot of the spread guys. That's more, that's mostly what I'm hearing now to tell you the truth is, is, um, Coach, this is our field, you know, concept. We're working here. If the boundary safety, you know, stays on the boundary, you know, works stays on the hash or works over top of the X to the boundary. If the safety rotates to the field, you know, or drops down, you know, like a buzz look, then I'm going to go to the boundary, you know. So it's, uh, I'm starting to hear that more and more, with, you know, with the same stuff. But what do you think about um, – and this – I'm digressing a little bit, but obviously it's 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 – it, there's nothing like talking to somebody that that knows the game intensely. And and what, what do you think about the fact that I, I, watching the NFL at least, um, then when you see the playoffs, two different worlds. The NFL regular season, what wins games? At least just my observation. Um, passing and scoring points wins a lot of games in a, in a regular season. And then you get to to the postseason. Obviously, the the championship game, the Super Bowl, showed that the most, but um, but running, running the ball and power game and being able to, to play defense was a very big part. Of, and and the, the passing attack was neutralized in some instances, not all, but some instances, um, you know, by, by guys playing uh, multiple coverages and, and sticking their best guy over their best guy and, and um, playing a lot of man-to-man and getting after people. Um, sure. How does the NFL – because they got to figure this out. The Wolf, and, and Bill Belichick has it figured out because he's got a hybrid going on, right? Yes, um, yes. You, you have the running attack. You have the fullback. You have the – you know, their fullback's a high-paid fullback. Um, they have the good running, running back. And then you have the – you know, in regular season, your high-powered spread game with a real good defense. How, how, does, how does an NFL team start to put together personnel? Because everyone thought coming into that Super Bowl game – that Coach McVay was going to be completely the – that that was going to be the future. Sure. And, and they ran the ball against Dallas. That's how they won the game against Dallas but, um, and played great defense. But, um, but now it's really like, okay, yes, you've got to have, um, you know, the spread passing game, which is a big part of college and high school, but now it's sure. the way the NFL. But you also be, have to be able to line up, um, you know, 23 personnel – um, 20 personnel and motion guys and, and, and do different kind of things and, and run a power attack. How, what, what, what is the solution to that at the, at the NFL level? You know, I think the NFL game is kind of turned into an 11 personnel league, you know, for the most part, right? It's so three receivers, you know, right. one three and one back. Um, and then base defense wise, right? So base nowadays really isn't base anymore. It's not, you know, it's not a four, three look or a three, four base look anymore. Now it's more of a four, two with a nickel. Right. You know, or a, you know, a three, three with a nickel, you know? So, uh, you know, the interesting thing with that is now you, you know, teams that play, you know, nickel defense all the time. Now you stick the fullback in the game. You kind of screw them up a little bit. Right. You know, so I, I thought the genius thing that Belichick did was, was one attack their protections beautifully in third and long. Um, you know, a lot of times out of an odd front, right? So, um, you know, the Rams were four man sliding a lot of times, which most teams do against an odd front. And he did a great job kind of keeping like a nickel smaller lineback safety kind of guy, you know, to the strong side and then looping him around to the weak side. So they were kind of – they were getting three on two to the weak side a lot of times and pressuring Jared Goff. Um, you know, Belichick forever um, usually will put his second best corner on your best player receiver-wise and double him with a safety knowing that you're going to go to two now, right? So he's, then he's going to put his best corner on two. So now he's going to lock down your best guy with two guys, put his best player on your second guy. So now you're going to live in the world of throwing the ball to number three and number four all the time. Um, you know, I, the nice thing about having two weeks for the Super Bowl for those guys is they were, there's so many tendencies, you know. So, you know, they were such a man-to-man team, and especially this year. Um, you know, they played a lot of cover two on early downs. And right. there was no big plays in the play-action game. Right? I, you know, maybe once, twice, right, they hit something like a deep over. Or, right. You know, something like that. But, you know, that's where they made their living was running the ball, like you said, and then play action off that. And they did a great job in the box stuffing the runs, you know, especially the uh, stretch play they love so much. You know, squashing gaps and make sure everybody, they were gaps down and they had 70 guys in their, in their gaps, you know. And then, but at the same time, not 
falling asleep, you know, on, on that back half of the plashing game. They really didn't give up anything, no, any chunk plays, you know. So, um, you know, it, it's going to be interesting as the NFL moves forward, like you said, the next couple of years, right? So everybody's fine to fall in love with the air raid stuff and, and your RPO stuff that's gotten so big in college football. And actually, I, I talked to Mark Schofield the other day about this. We, uh, we did a nice little thing that's going to come out soon. We talked about how kind of the air raid in the RPO game has kind of worked its way into the NFL and kind of why. And then obviously from a draft standpoint, and you know, you go through it, um, you know, 10 years ago, if you heard an air raid guy, it was kind of like, oh, no, 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 we're not going to touch that guy. Right. You know, right? He threw for 5,000 yards and 50 touchdowns just because of the system. That's it. You know, and I think you're starting to see better quarterbacks at those programs, you know. So, you know, I mean, just, you know, I talk to Davis about this all the time. Like, look at look at that room he was in. You know, it was him. It was Pat Mahomes. It, you know, it was, um, you know, it was uh, Baker Mayfield. It was Michael right. Brewer who left, you know, went to Virginia Tech and started. I mean, that was one quarterback room. Right. You know, it's the first pick in the draft. That's the 10th pick in the draft. And that's the third round pick in one room, you know. So you're seeing better players go to those schools as well. Yeah, because they want to throw. I mean, that's sure. the bottom line. The quarterbacks sure. want to throw. And, 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 and I, I think what's interesting is, like, I look at it like uh, basically Bill Pelichick was looking at that game. You leave your skinny guys on the field. We'll bring our big guys in and, you know, you leave your big guys on the field and, and we'll put our skinny guys in. And, right. and they have a unique set of skinny guys, meaning – their skinny guys are short, quick guys that are – are uh, you can't have a six-foot-one, 200-pound corner on those guys and cover them as right. nickel. Right. And that's what I think is so unique, how they, they develop their personnel, is that you have uh, – you know, you'll, you'll have your traditional, quote-unquote, tall receiver. Then you have such skinny, quick guys like James White, who's like a running back and right. a receiver – Burkhead, who's a tailback and a receiver, and then obviously Edelman, and then so they're 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 waiting to see who you think that they have on the field, and then they just kind of go against the grain on that. It's everything, you know. I bet you if you talked to Bel Belichick and you actually cornered him and you're actually able to get him in in uh, in, in an actual real conversation, right. it it would be. I'm just looking at it logically, like <laughs> there are heavy guys out there. I'm going to put my skinny guys out there. Right, it's not that hard, right? Like, right, right. You know, um, right. Exactly. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. Like, you know, I, I've also heard through people that, you know, if, if you look at their offensive line, they have the highest wonder look scores of any offensive line in the NFL. You know, so he'll take a lower, a lower rated guy that has a, a higher wonder look score over say, you know, a, a higher rated guy who scored kind of low on it. So, you know, obviously with the wonder look on offense, it's what? It's, Offensive line, your quarterback, and your tight end, you know, those three guys, you know, they want the highest one look scores. Like, let's see how they think and they, and they process information. So, I always thought that was interesting. You know, like, and it makes sense. You want smart, tough guys that are going to do their job. Yeah, their center, Dave Andrews, is a good example of that. Um, Dave Andrews, you know, he was he a was great, great, great center in college, but doesn't have any of the measurables that normally you look at. We, we'd actually talked to him. I knew him from our events for many years. Okay. What I knew about him was he was brilliant, literally brilliant intellectually. Yep. And obviously you – know, you know, Your center is the smartest guy, right? I mean, yeah. you're all coach, right? Your, your smartest guy is usually your center because he's making all the calls, odds and evens, right? So, yeah, it's, I, I agree 100% with you. And as soon as he got picked up by the, the – um, the uh, Patriots, were, uh, me and my partner at the time, were like, oh, he's definitely making it. Like, that they will truly appreciate what David Andrew – and next thing you know, he was starting right away and the and, 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 and rest is history. But right. that's, so, that's so interesting. Well, let, let's talk a little bit on the business side. So, um, uh, we, talk, we talked a lot of football, but what do you think, you know, separates yourself from other quarterback coaches that might be out there or, or people that run businesses – like that, that has developed the following that you have. And, and you don't have to give away any secrets, but, you know, right. I mean, I could tell a lot from your personality, obviously. I think you got a fantastic personality and gravitate towards that. Sure. Um, obviously, you're knowledgeable. What, what do you think are some of the things that, that separate you? Um, you know, I think the biggest thing for me that's helped me the most is, like I said, I, you know, I've coached for a long time and I've coached, you know, I've coached 43 high school seasons between football, basketball, baseball, and track. You know, so I, I know how to coach and teach. Right. You know, so I think that helps tremendously. I, I've been a teacher for 15 years, so I know how to kind of teach it to every kind of learner um, at every kind of age for the most part. So, you know, I think for me, from a training standpoint, like I said, you know, I, I coached first. So, like, when I do a lesson, I, I treat you like you're my quarterback. You know, like, I, I'm at practice right now. 
you know, it's not so much a, um, you know, like you see like uh, in the lab or like, you know, all that stuff you read people write about. So I, to me, it's not a lab. I'm on, I'm on the field. Right. You're my quarterback. You know, if I'm training you, you're my quarterback for that session. So, you know, I, I think I work that way. I, you know, I'm not, you know, a lot, obviously the college coaches love the stuff that I'm doing with their guys and I'm getting great beef, feedback from them. And you know, the biggest thing they tell me is like, you know, I don't see any bags. I don't see any cones. I don't see, you know, any, any bands in your stuff. And I'm like, well, no, I wouldn't do that at practice, you know? So, you know, everything I, I believe in doing is, is about being game relevant, making somebody more fundamentally sound, cleaning up their footwork, being able to move in the pocket, understand the game, understand how footwork is tied into every single route we're going to throw and why, you know, on, you know, different drops and, and, and those kind of things, you know? So I think what's kind of separated me is that, you know, I'm a coach first, you know, I'm not one of those, uh, you know, I, I got into this later, which kind of helped me. I, I think just because again, it's, it's a combination of being a teacher, of being a coach for so long, one and two. And then the last thing is obviously I'm, you know, I'm, I'm lucky that I'm, I have access to the Peyton Mannings and Eli Mannings and the, you know, those guys in the world where you're constantly uh, reflecting on what you're teaching, you know, like, is this right? Is there a better way of doing this? You know, because again, it's, you know, if Eli's doing it, that means Tom Brady was doing it because they all steal from each other, you know? So every time I get down to, there in the summer in, in Thibodeau, Louisiana for camp, a lot of times it's, I'm teaching this, you know, what do you like about this? I love it. It's part of the, part of the deal right there. <laughs> <laughs> it, looks like a, it looks like a linebacker to me. Oh, he's way, way too so I, 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 he, he, He's made a guest appearance on almost every single one as soon as he got a half hour in. <laughs> um, I love it. Uh, well, I want to – Troy, give me two seconds. You want to give me a couple minutes? You want to say hi to Coach? No? No, what's up, my man? How you doing? Say hi. Uh, this only makes it this – is, this is like appearance number four this year. <laughs> Um, uh, Troy, give me one minute and then we'll, we'll get right back to it. Okay. So there's one other thing I wanted to know that's really, really interesting about, um, uh, of the way that you do things. So, you know, when I coach track, I coach track for a long time myself and, right. and I coach coaching football and football. A lot of times, you know, you get into strategy and everything like that. What I loved about track was the technical sure. things about it. Um, and when I started coaching football, and, and, and specifically position-wise, because I coached track first before I coached football, um, I, I realized that that technical aspect I learned in track really could apply to football in, right. in a unique way because a lot of coaches don't go that deep Absolutely. in the technical aspect and teaching that and combining that with strategy. What is your like kind of thought on that from that standpoint? No, I, you know – I agree with you 100%. Like, I, you know, the, the biggest thing for me is, is even when I train, you know, quarterbacks, obviously we start with all those little details, right? And we break everything, every single thing down. And, again, a lot of times I kind of worked backwards, right? So, like you asked about the jump stop before, a lot of things I've done with, with stuff I teach is because I see the mistakes people make. And it kind of built me into a philosophy of what I teach with certain things. Like, so, for instance, I, I don't teach shoulders as a power source, right? So, a lot of people teach – you know, rotate your hips and shoulders through the throw, you know, and a lot of times I've seen guys that try to use their shoulders so much as a power source, right? So the front shoulder is usually tied to my throwing elbow, right? So my front shoulder opens too soon, my throwing elbow drops and I come across my body, right? So a lot of times I, the stuff I teach is, is based off the issues that I see with guys, again, at all levels, you know, so, um, you know, that's the nice thing about the way I do things is that, you know, at the end of the day, I'm always going to do fundamental stuff first, right? But at the end of the day, we're always going to kind of tie that into real football, right? Because at the end of the day, it's about playing real football better, right? So, you know, it's understanding how to throw a curl. It's understanding how to drop and maybe slide and have to throw the same curl. You know, it's, it's cover three, the ball's thrown usually in this window. If it's cover two, it might be the next window. If it's man free, inside leverage, I might have to put the ball on his back shoulder, bring him down the stem a little bit. So it's you know, just throwing a curl, there's four or five different ways of throwing it, right? So, right. Um, you know, so that's kind of – I try to teach all things through that session, you know. So, I, I agree with you. You know, a lot, a lot of the med ball stuff that I do is, is, again, breaking those fundamental things down, like you said, through the smallest details. But at the end of the day, at the end of the session, they need to be able to play football as well. well what do you think about um, – you know, from a business standpoint, where does it go from, from here for you – within what you're doing. So do you think that um, the current state of what you're doing can continue to expand? Is it something that you want to continue to expand or is it something that um, 
you know, you're going to continue to focus more on elite guy. Like it's, it's a really interesting, you know, business model because I always found training uh, to be something that, you know, once you get your expertise and you continue to develop people underneath you sure. or you have to, uh, in order to expand or right. do you keep it like where it is and then does that begin to strap your time and do you get at some point say to yourself how do how do I expand from it where where, where do you where do you see it going for you so, um, that's that's a great question and one honestly I, I struggle with at times just because um, you know I, I've never had this goal of being like you know I want to be the best trainer in New Jersey or I want to be the best trainer in the country that's never crossed my mind you know like how do you even justify that you know like how do you how do you compare that? You know, so I, I think that, um, you know, I think I put out a great product, right? I think the kids know they get better every single minute they spend with me. Um, I think there's, there's an evolution over time, you know, from junior year, senior year or freshman year in college, to sophomore year in college. I, you know, I think the, the, the beauty of the quarterback position is, um, and, and I, you know, I went through this a lot with a lot of the college guys that I trained because they're young, right? So, you know, a lot of times like Kenny Pickett per se from Pitt, right? Who I've had for a while. Um, you know, like ha had some glimpses as a true freshman, right, where he did a great job. Sophomore year, you know, had some great moments and obviously struggled at times, you know. So, you know, I think for him, I think it's like, you know, as a quarterback, sometimes you go, okay, I threw for 15 touchdowns as a sophomore. Well, that I means I got to throw for 20 as a junior. It's not, it's not a better year. Or you might be, you might be a five times better player, right, but you might have lost some, some players on the outside. You know, your, your OC might have changed. It's a different scheme. You know, so, um, you know, I, I think for me, you know, the answer to your question without getting long-winded is, you know, I don't, I don't really have goals in, in what I'm doing. You know, it's kind of – I take it day by day. I take it week by week. Um, you know, and, I, and it's kind of worked out for me, you know. So, I know, you know, by, by times of year, I know when I'm busy. I know when I'm not busy. Like, you know, right now, obviously, with the high school kids rocking and rolling, I got, you know, five NFL draft guys with me right now that are here full-time. And obviously, you know, you know, David I still talk to and kind of train – you know, through, through cell phones and those kind of things up at UConn, you know. So, you know, like those guys are taking my attention obviously during the week and I'm spending a lot of time with them obviously because I want to put a great product out there because I know they're right. with me. You know, and obviously as we get through this thing and those guys get into, you know, mini camps and those kind of things and I really start diving in more and more to the high school kids, kind of getting them ready for, you know, their seasons or camps or whatever their goal is, you know. So, um, you know, I, really from a time standpoint, I, I don't know if I have more time, you know. So, um, I, I don't think if there's a niche, I, I don't know. I, I, I enjoy kind of to answer your question. I enjoy high school kids. I enjoy college kids. I enjoy pro, pro guys. Do I, do I see myself working with them, you know, next year, five years from now? Absolutely. You know, I, I think all three groups make me a better coach with the other two, if that makes sense. You know, teach, you know, teaching a freshman kid the same day I'm teaching a, you know, a four year vet in the NFL, you know, so uh, the Cowboys have reached out to me. They want me to train Dak Prescott. You know, over the next couple of months up here, either in Jersey, you're going to fly me down to Dallas, obviously, when I'm done with the combine and stuff. So, you know, you get a guy like Dak, and, and, you know, it could be two things on Dak Prescott that's holding him back fundamentally. You know, that, you know, hopefully I'll find out in the next, you know, five to 10 minutes of a throwing session, you know. So, um, you know, stuff like that comes on your plate, and it's, it's again, it's, it's awesome. It's exciting, but it's um, the crazy thing, again, about the quarterback position is, is you're so tied into the team you play on and, and your system, you know. So, there's some great players out there that play on some really good teams, right? With with um, some unimaginative offenses that don't look like really good players, and there's some you know there's some okay guys out there that play on some freaking awesome teams with some great coaches that can scheme guys up, you know. So that's kind of the um, the stressful things about me in the fall is seeing those college guys go play and you, you can't help them, you know. Like you did all you could from a fundamental standpoint and all the stuff in the classroom that you spend, but at the end of the day, it's about you know they got to do their job on their teams. Absolutely. What what is it that um, um, quarterbacks in college can do? I mean, I maybe part of it's what you said earlier is that self assessment that they can really help themselves in season when they're not able to get that level of coaching that they might have been able to get uh, when they're out of season. That individual attention, I should say. Sure. I mean, obviously, they have their position periods, but you know that's not ample. Right. You know, Fifteen minutes each day, or right, if that, yeah. Yeah, if that, right, yeah. to, to be able to get things done. What, 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 what would you recommend they start to do to be able to, to help themselves in season? Um, well, you know, you know, like it's funny you say that. Like usually most, most uh, you know, training camps are about a 12-minute indie period. 
And usually by game three or four, it gets cut down to about seven minutes. Um, that's usually what most college division one staffs will do. So in seven minutes, how much fundamental stuff you get? You're lucky to get, you know, a couple throws in. So the biggest thing I tell those guys is you need to pick three or four drills that you want to do in Indy no matter what. You know, so like, for instance, at Rutgers, I tell, you know, I've trained all the Rutgers guys at some point between Art and, and Jonathan Lewis and uh, Jalen Chapman who transferred. But, you know, um, you know, what I'll tell those guys is, listen, Nick, you need to do these four drills no matter what. You know, whether it's before practice, whether it's in Indy, if Coach McDulty gives you time to do it, which he does. You know, you need to do these four things, which will keep you sharp fundamentally. And then you need to find a down period at some point in practice, whether it's a water break, right, or a special teams kind of thing where you're not doing much on the side. And then you need to do these two or three drills that, you know, because you open your front shoulder, this is your drill, right? Um, because you're an overstrider, this is your drill, right? If you're, uh, you're a hip slide guy, right? So when you step, you transfer all your weight to your front leg. All right, this is the drill you need to do. So, you know, like, so what I'll do with those guys is, is A, these are drills you need to do because, you know, they're the right drills to do from a fundamental standpoint. And B, these are drills you need to do because this is what you do wrong when you're wrong. You know, and then, you know, this is how you can fix it. So that way it's kind of like if you threw three or four bad balls in that period, that's it, right? It's not a bad practice or, right. a, bad, or a bad week for you, you know, which, which happens with guys because, you know, and we've all been there. I've been there. You know, it's where like that week you just don't have it. You don't feel right. You feel <laughs> off. Right? You're not throwing a tight ball. You're, you know, you're, you're a little behind. You're a little bit low. You're, you're just, you know, your deep ball is lacking a little bit. It's, it's, it could be just one little thing, one little tweak in your back. Yeah, it's it's stealing time. I mean, that's, yes. that's the key things. How, how well can you steal time? I, uh, you know, it's one of the thing. One of the things I always tell my players, like when you know you got these little two minute breaks in between. What are you doing in between? You know, are you gonna sit down? Sit, you, know, you gotta get water. I get it. You gotta get right. Kidding. right. But as soon as you get all that stuff done, um, you need to be figuring out ways to steal time because there's only so much time in the, in the day in practice, and and uh, that that's how you get better. I mean, that's how we always found uh, long snappers and and. Um, sure. You know, it, it, it always found kickers. Like, uh, we always get guys stealing time, and it, that's, that's one of the ways, ways to do it. No, I, I, that's a great coaching point. I, I agree with you 100%. Like, so a lot of times, a lot of the college guys, they'll come home with me, right? Like I said, I kind of, you know, you have to clean them up fundamentally from what they did at the end of the year or they didn't feel right, and they kind of, you know, got lazy with some things maybe or, or things weren't coached because, again, you're putting in plays. Right. Uh, you know, but a lot of times they'll come home and we'll, we'll fix some things and focus on some things, and then when they go back to school – I'll give them four, five, six, seven things. I'll write it down for them that they need to focus on when they throw with their guys when they get back to campus. You know, that way when they go into spring ball, they, you know, they're, they're good to go. And then when they come out of spring ball at the end of the year, you know, I tell them to write down and take notes on stuff they struggle with, where it could be second-level throws to the left. It could be deep throws to the right. Um, it could be seam throws, right, where they're, you know, sometimes they're too flat with the football. Um, it could be off-balance on hitches. You know, like my, my hitch game coach, I just don't feel right. I'm getting too forward. You know, and then when they come home, you know, at the end of the uh, at the end of semester, you know, like after spring practice is over, going into the summer, that's what we focus on. You know, and again, you kind of empower them by doing that stuff because, again, they like I said, they. My biggest thing is is you need to know yourself and you need to know how to fix yourself, right? So if I'm always just telling you what to do, you know, the nice thing is when they do come home, they they know what they're doing because they they either they assess themselves or they got it from their their quarterback coach, offensive coordinator, which again, you're you're helping that guy out, so. You know, sometimes you get a guy that doesn't like the fact that you work with their guys or, you know, you fight that sometimes. Yeah. Um, you know, but, you know, at the end of the day, if, if you're helping them get their guy better and the good ones out there know that they don't have time, they don't have time to fix those guys because, you know, they can't coach them the offseason. So. You can't coach them. Well, that's that's the big thing is I always – I told, my kids, you got to go to somebody in the offseason if you're a quarterback. I mean uh-huh. – and if you're not going to somebody that's good, you know, you're, you're not getting better. And then next thing you know, like, if you're just waiting until when we come around in June. Yeah, too late. It's too late. And yep. you're right. We can't work with them. Like, like you know, you could stand back and, and you could hand them a drill sheet, but you can't get on the field with them and, and, and coach them up to fire the points. Right. So there's only so much you can really do with them. And um, that's, that's, that's problem some and, and, uh, if they don't get with somebody and, and fine tune those things, yeah, it, it is it is way too late. It's an it's an exploding world. It's funny because when I started, um, when I started running my camps back in two thousand five, I mean this there was a couple people maybe you know, and uh, now, now uh, any guy that's picked up a football and thrown it a few yards. <laughs> uh, listen, I, it's, it's funny because I, I have uh, Steve Calhoun who runs Armed and Dangerous. Oh, yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, so Steve's one of my best friends, right? Yep. So he's my roommate at the Manning camp with uh, Rich Bartell. 
Yeah, you know, the three of us were always together, and um, along with David Morris, right from QB Country. So the four of us are kind of like that's our pack, you know. So it's funny because he always says like, "You think it's bad in Jersey? Come to Cali, bro." So he always said, "Come to Cali, bro." Every five yards, there's somebody. You know, it might have been a freshman quarterback in high school that's doing lessons, you know, so – and they're getting clients. You know, like, you're seeing six, oh. eight, ten, fifteen. You know, they're it, all getting – yeah, they're getting some clients. It's, 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 it's funny because – yeah, I know Steve Calhoun because Steve Calhoun did – shoot, my very first camps in California back in, like, 2007, 2008. Like, yeah. Steve was just beginning. I mean, he was doing QBs already, but, like, was just beginning – to, to build it. I don't think it was called – might not have been called Armed and Dangerous back okay. then. It might just been like Steve Calhoun training at that time. Right, right. Now, you know, it evolved into that. But, yeah, it's funny because I've worked with um, many – I don't know if you heard of Jeff Christensen. I work with Jeff. Yeah, Christensen. yeah, sure. Sure, I, I've talked to him a bunch. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Jeff was uh, – Jeff um, is a good friend. I've known him for many years. He, he started – I met him back in my camps back in like 2007, 2008 because Chicago, was, right out in Chicago. Yeah, in Chicago. Yeah, yeah. He would come work work my camps, and 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 he's a unique guy, and and he's he's the right fit for certain people, and not the right fit for other people. I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I know, you know, he'll tell you that too. So absolutely. Um, um, and and I think that's uh, I think it's an interesting thing because you're you're it's it has exploded everywhere, and. Um, but I, there are people that do things much better than others. And, and I think besides the technique, by the way, I learned a lot from a technique standpoint, just listening to you. Um, uh, but besides that part, the, the, the mindset of helping, helping guys understand the ability to teach kids and, and, and to help them grow and, and be able to do it the right way, not just throwing out, you know, like a lot of what you mentioned, like, you know, guys pulling out contraptions, you know, it takes more time for some of these guys to pull out their contraptions. Coach. It's, it's funny. Like, you know, I, I always felt like, um, and, and I tell my quarterbacks this all the time, like if I go watch a practice, right. And I see a guy like hopping over bags and shuffling through bags and, and sliding around cones and that guy's just wasting time. Like that's, that's a indie period time killer. <laughs> <laughs> where that guy just doesn't feel like, right? There's so many more things to the position. Right. You no, know, I, I could take four drills and do those four drills in 45 minutes. Like, that's how right. depth those drills are. That, and, again, like, you know, a, a first-level throw, a second-level throw, a third-level throw all change within those four little drills, you know? So, I, I think, you know, I think from the quarterback world standpoint, I think, you know, like you said, there was just a couple guys kind of doing it in the beginning. And I, and I don't know if they were very good at it. They just kind of had everybody because no one else was doing it, you know. And I, I think better people kind of come along. And I think there's there's kind of a bitterness because of that. Right. But they're not as good as other people out there. And, and But, you know, so they're losing clients and they get mad at you. And, you know, my whole thing has always been if I worked really hard, I teach them all the right stuff, which I know I do, and I treat people right, I'm good. I yeah. care less what people say. And, you know, a lot of times you even see stuff in the social media world, right, where somebody, you, know, you post like an eight-second video and then everybody's got a critique on it. Meanwhile, you know, that's eight seconds out of an hour and 20-minute workout. You know? so <laughs> how do you even know what that guy's – you know, and again, like – and I do it sometimes. Like you see somebody post something, you're like, that, that kid goes to that guy for that? But again, I don't, I don't know what he's being taught for the other hour and a half that he's there. He might do a great job, you know. So who am I to comment on anybody, you know. So – um that's the biggest thing I see is everybody kind of – it's funny. It's, it's an ego-driven world. Obviously, you have quarterbacks, training quarterbacks, so you got some alpha males mixed in there. So, um, I keep my opinions myself. I just work hard and I stay in my own lane. And it's kind of worked out for me. And everybody else kind of beats each other up, and I just kind of sit back and, and do my thing. So, um, I don't get caught up with it. And that's it. You've done a, And you've done a great job. I mean, the client base you have. I mean, and more and more, your name comes up. So, like, as I – as uh, I always go to as like there there are people that I know right, and then I always go to basically like what other ki- what kids start to say to me right, and sure. and then obviously I like to see it too. And that obviously helps because I think I'm a pretty smart guy, and, sure. and I can recognize when someone knows how to coach. Because um, really, that's what it comes down to is like you know wh- when people talk about being a QB trainer or any kind of trainer they are, like you know. Uh, when, I, when I think of trainer, I, th- I think of like the personal trainer that's you know right. teaching someone how to do uh, walking lunges. Right, right, exactly, exactly. And and and, and giving them the water bottle. Out with, uh, <laughs> that's you're, what I think. you're a coach. Right, you're a coach. You, yeah. you know, a coach. A coach comes in there and not just teaches you drills, but helps you understand the important parts of the game and 
and all those kind of things. That's, that's what I love about what you're doing. Like you come, you're a coach first, you're, you're a teacher first. Appreciate it. And, and those, those two things are, um, are the, are the key, I think, to really being successful in, in, in this in the long run, because a coach and a teacher and, and, and like I would say, what, it, what you said is so true. The drills, things like it's like, OK, you, you want to see me? I can make up magic drills. I can make them up as good as anyone. No doubt. Know? Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, I think guys, you know, they copy the Elite 11 model right at times or they, um, you know, again, they see stuff on YouTube that that kind of looks good. And it, why are you teaching it? You know, at the end of the day, I can tell right. you every single thing that I teach you and why and what and the purpose of that to help you be a better quarterback playing the game of football. You know, if, it fit in, if it doesn't fit into that, I don't do it, you know? So there's so many more details to every single thing, you know, a first window throw, it could be a second window throw. It could be over top of somebody layering the football. There's so many little things to go over. You know, like I, I could be there for three hours if I wanted to, you know? So, you know, I think the biggest thing, you know, for me is that, um, you know, the ultimate compliment is guys like you telling me that and, and obviously high school coaches, you know, and that's kind of, I've had so many high school coaches reach out and like, will you please train my quarterback? He's been going to, you know, whatever, whoever. And it's right, right. They've only gotten worse. Right. You know, like, they're getting better, but they're getting worse. And, and uh, could you please almost, you know, fix them in a way? So, uh, I mean, to me, that's the old cop that your peers are sending you kids. Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. Well, on, on that note, let's um, t- tell everybody where they can find you, how they can get in touch with you, you know. All the, all, all the different social media, <laughs> right? Well, whatever you want to give them information. Uh, it's really easy at Tony Raz zero three. So that's my, uh, that's my Twitter page as well as my Instagram page. Um, I'm at test football Academy, which is in Martinsville, New Jersey. Um, you know, we're about 15 minutes North of Rutgers, uh, right up Martinsville, which is up, up the hill there. Um, so, you know, most of the time I'm based out of test while well, obviously the weather's cold here in Jersey, but, you know, once it gets nice out, obviously I expand out to, uh, to different fields and different parts of New Jersey. Very cool. Very cool. Thanks so much for being on. I uh, appreciate you. Uh, absolute pleasure. I probably talked to you for five hours. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt about it. Well, thanks uh, for having me, Dad. I appreciate everything you do. And, and again, I've followed your camps for forever. And obviously know you as a tremendous coach and, and the business you built, you know, from a, from an agent standpoint. And again, you have a tremendous eye for talent and, and the, the guys you represent are high character guys who can play the game. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I love the game. My life's been about it. So uh, as is yours and uh, you know, best of luck continuing in the future. Same here, my man. Thank you. Bye.